So dividing Jesus offer once for all. So today's part 12, two goats, two witnesses. So for the last two parts, we looked at the sin offering. Actually, the sin offering that we looked at uh, for the past two weeks is the sin offering that was offered every day. In other words, daily sin offering. But the sin offering that we're going to start looking at from today is the sin offering that was offered on the Day of Atonement. I think I gave you a kind of very brief uh, picture of the difference of between the daily sin offering and the yearly sin offering. From today, we're going to uh, look at the yearly sin offering, which was offered on the Day of Atonement, and then, and then see the significance of it. The characteristics of the sin offering on the Day of Atonement, we have several, but today we're going to focus on one characteristic of the sin offering on the Day of Atonement. That is this. But Leviticus chapter 16, it says, And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord. I want you to remember this phrase because we uh, are going to come back to this phrase in many ways throughout this sermon, today's sermon. So he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. Okay, we're going to read the next part, uh, rest of the part later. So basically here, the, the picture that is drawn here is that the priest brings the two goats, of, um, two goats and present them before the Lord. And then Aaron casts lots for the two goats. So what do the two goats that were brought and presented before the Lord and casting lots stand for. I think uh, there are many kind of mis misinterpretations or misunderstandings about this picture because it is described in a very, very simple way. Uh, so many people don't really regard this as an as a important factor, important element of the Day of Atonement event. But this has a very significant meaning. So we are going to look at that. Um, so what do the two goats and casting lots stand for? First, number two in the Bible represents something. Uh, can you think of any meanings of number two in the Bible? Well, some of you may have already come up with uh, the meanings of number two in the Bible. So number two in the Bible usually means witness, a number of witnesses. Well, here, Numbers 35, whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death uh, on the testimony of witnesses. But one witness is not sufficient testimony against the person for the death penalty. So one witness is not enough. At least two witnesses or more, at least two, right? So Revelation chapter 11, here we find um, another explanation. Here, I will, give you, uh, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lambs stand standing before the God of the earth. So here, the, uh, the number two keeps occurring. So here, and throughout the Bible, we have so many other symbols and so many other things that carry this meaning. Like two tablets of the covenant, right? And the very first two human beings created by God. So two witnesses. So actually Adam and Eve, they are 
the witnesses of the character of God. And the two tablets of the covenant actually are the manifestation of the character of God. So witness, right? So number two is a number of a witness. And uh, it is not two rams, but it is two goats that were presented before the Lord. Uh, actually, ram and goat are the animals that were used in the service of the sanctuary. I mean, even it had been rams that were used for this, uh, it would not have many, uh, it would have been pretty much the same. Not same, but it would, it would have been uh, very similar, very understandable, because this is what is happening in the sanctuary, right? I mean, even a cow or a bull could have been used. But here, specifically, goat is used, right? Two goats. Uh, I didn't put it up everything about goat, but let me, let me share with you a very uh, important difference between a lamb or ram and a goat. When a ram is attacked, when a lamb is attacked, usually lamb does not make any sound. Lambs just, you know, they just accept it, right? Like when he is speared with a with a um, with a knife or you know, what is it? Uh, I I don't remember like other. Uh, form of knife but when when a lamb is speared with a with a knife lambs almost always well i think i should say almost always because you know there might be some um exceptions but anyway very generally lambs die without making any sound and this is the reason why the animal lamb is used to present to symbolize Jesus Christ for the death of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was going through all the, all the struggles, all the like pains, he was silent. He didn't make any sound. And this is the reason why lamb was used to symbolize Jesus. But what is different about goat is that when goat is attacked when goat is pierced with knife goat is not like lamb goat makes sounds very aggressive sound and you know uh, sometimes goat uh, tries to you know hit the person right runs into the person try to trying to escape the situation so this is one of the major differences uh, between a lamb and a goat. And I thought that this characteristic of the goat is very appropriate because witnesses should not be silent when they are attacked, when they are in a danger um, to stand up for what is right. Right? We have to make sound. Well, with these days, we, we participate in a rally, uh, you know, making voice to the society. Black Lives Matter. Right? So, you know, when, even when we are attacked, even when we are in danger, we have to make uh, sound. We have to stand up for what is right. And this is uh, what seems to be the reason why a goat is used for this because number two represents witness and also goat the characteristic of the goat uh, gives us a very clear picture of what uh, witnesses should be so here two goats two witnesses for sinners because again on the day of atonement uh, I mean, the Day of Atonement is the final process of all the system, all the, 
all the processes of the sanctuary. This is the last day. So these two goats were brought and presented before the Lord as two witnesses for sinners. But at this point, we don't know which one is telling the truth, which one is telling the lie. They look very similar. They look the same. Two goats, right? And in this time, when these two goats were presented before the Lord, Yes, no one knows yet who is telling a lie uh, or truth. No one knows yet who, who would be for the Lord's and who, which one would be for Azazel. So they cast lots for the two goats to decide, to choose. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16 verse 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, which means the lot is cast by the hands of the humans. So humans cast lots, but every it's every decision is from the Lord. Even though it is human beings, even though it is human being uh, humans that that cast lots, it it seems like uh, it is humans that decide something. But under the sin, it is God that decides everything. It's every decision is from. The Lord. God knows everything, so He makes a decision on a complete basis, on a, on a perfect foundation, perfect ground. Well, I didn't put it up on screen, but uh, in the Bible, we have many instances where uh, casting lots was used to decide something, right? Uh, but every time when, when uh, lots were cast, it was the decisions of God, not humans. When the um, one position of the two uh, twelve disciples had to be filled, lot a lot was cast to decide which one to fill the position. Right? It was not like you know very like random choice. It was not like God was saying that you know. I think both of you are great, so it's okay, uh, either um, you or you. Well, it's not like that. God made a decision on a complete base, on a complete foundation, ground. God um, intentionally, God purposefully chose the person. So casting lots actually tells us that it is decided by the perfect decision of God with the perfect ground, with the complete basis, with all the evidences. So what do the two goats and casting lots stand for? God decides among the two witnesses who is telling the truth with uh, the perfect ground. So this picture, you know, bringing the two goats and casting lots and choosing which one is for the Lord, which one is for the for Azazel. This is a picture of God's judgment. Uh, we're gonna <clears throat> take a cl a little closer look at that. Here, uh, Deuteronomy chapter nineteen: One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits by the mouth of two or through witnesses. We already looked at this. The matter shall be established. If a false witness rises, if a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men, two men, they are witnessing, right? But uh, one man is making a false witness. So those, those two men, both men in the controversy, shall stand before the Lord. So this is exactly the picture of the two goats being presented before the Lord. We don't know yet who is telling the truth, who is telling the lie. We don't know yet. Before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. So two opposite witnesses for a sinner. So on one side, the witness is saying that, oh, this man, 
did it intentionally. And on the other side, another witness is saying that, oh no, he didn't do it intentionally. He didn't want to do it. But he just couldn't but choose it because of certain like environments and surroundings and stuff. He did it unintentionally. So here, Revelation chapter 12 gives us a, a picture of who Satan really is. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Satan deceives us all the time, the whole world. What is the purpose of Satan deceiving us? Because he wants to choose against God's law. And, okay, let me read uh, on. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So Satan is not only a deceiver, but Satan is an accuser. What does he mean? He first deceives us to choose um, against God's law, uh, telling us, you know, that is the best way. You're going to be like God, just like he deceived Eve, right? He said, oh, you know, once you, once you eat it, you're going to be like God. He deceived Eve. And he is deceiving us to choose something against God's will. And then, what he tries to do is that, oh, because he chose it, he needs to die. Right? And he did it intentionally. So he, he wants to show it to the world. He wants to show, he wants to show it to the universe that we, we sinners deserve die, death. So he is a false accuser, accuser. Here, Job chapter one. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man, who, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? What does it mean? There is a reason why he does it. Because, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and, and um, around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hand and his possessions have increased in the land. And this is the reason why Job fears you. So he is kind of trying to distort the intent of, of Job. right? And God had to show to the universe that it is not true. right? And that's why God allowed Satan to go out and do what he suggested, right? He is distorting. He is falsely accusing Job here from the book of Zechariah. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. So here, uh, the picture we have is that there is a sinner um, set in the center and on both sides, Satan and the Lord, right? The Satan is trying to oppose him, trying to accuse him of his wrongdoing, of his transgression, right? But on the, on the other side, the Lord says, rebuke you, Satan, right? The Lord has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a branch plant from the fire? Right? Of course, he did it, but it was not his intention. He was in the fire because of you, because you deceived, and then you led him into that. But he didn't want to be there. So our uh, Bible commentary says, While Joshua was interceding before God for his people, Satan stood close by to oppose and thwart 
his endeavors by bringing against Joshua and his people the charge of sinfulness. Of course, it is, it is not because that, um, it is not because the children of Israel were sinless. Of course, they were sinful. Of course, they were sinners. But uh, one thing that we can discover here is that Satan is trying to accuse them of the intent, even though they didn't want to do it. Even though they were deceived by Satan and chose it, Satan is trying to say, you know, they did it. He pointed to the transgressions of Israel as the reason why the people should not be restored to divine favor. And basically, this is the accusation that he tries to make for all of us. He presents all the transgressions of us as a reason why we should not be restored to divine favor. And he says, we do not deserve to be restored to the covenant relationship. The two people involved in the dispute, so Jesus and Satan involved in this dispute, must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at that time, the judges must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against the fellow Israelite, then do the false witness as that witness intended to do to the other party. You must purge the evil from among you. So the judges must make a thorough investigation. So here, two people represents Jesus and Satan, and the judge represents God. So God makes a very clear judgment by a thorough investigation with the perfect ground. Because Numbers uh, 35, uh, well, even though this is not uh, directly connected to the sanctuary system, but I already talked about the linkage uh, the connection between the refuge and uh, sanctuary. Some town, select some towns to be your cities of refuge to which a person who has killed someone accidentally may flee. They will be places of refuge from the avenger so that anyone accused of murder may not die before they stand trial before the assembly. So here, uh, Bible commentary says just what duties the congregation performed is not stated in detail but undoubtedly undoubtedly the whole procedure was forensic with presentation of evidence discussion and decision by jury you know actually this is actually the scene of the heavenly judgment we already looked at um, this from uh, the book of Daniel. As I looked, thrones were set in place. The very last sentence, the court was seated. The court was seated and the books were opened. So the books play a very important role in this judgment. Also in the book of Revelation chapter 20, uh, John saw the very, very, very same uh, scene here. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Right? And books were opened, the yellow letters, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. You know, if the dead, if the, the wicked, are judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books, then the righteous also should be judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So the book of sin and the book of remem remembrance. Of course, the book of life. Right. So on the basis of this, the judge should be, gi should be giving the clear evidence before the whole congregation. So that they can understand right it is not like the judge says you know i know everything so you know this uh, this person should be restored back to back to life and this this one should be put to death 
you know, it is not like very random um, choice decision, but the decision should be based on a very clear evidence, very clear, very, very um, strong ground. So when the judge, when the judgment is made, when the sentence is made with the, with all the evidence, the sentence is executed right away. Anyone who kills a person is to be put to death as a murderer only on the testimony of witness. We remember uh, more than two witnesses, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of one only one witness. Do not accept the ransom for the life of a murderer. Well, this is a very strong, strong statement. Do not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who deserves to die. They are to be put to death. Even a ransom was not to be accepted. You know, in the time of medieval ages, uh, medieval age, you know, dark ages, right? The church uh, required a ransom for their sin. They, they were asking for money for forgiveness. So a lot of people brought money for forgiveness. But here, um, do not accept the ransom for the life of a murderer. It's very clear from the Bible. Even though someone is proved to be one who killed unintentionally, the person is not released right away. What happened next? The assembly must protect the one accused of murder from the avenger of blood and send the accused back to the city of refuge to which they fled. So uh, the, the one who killed unintentionally fled to the cities of refuge and then waited for the trial. And through the trial, through the judgment, he was proved to be innocent, which means the person killed uh, someone unintentionally. But still, he, even though he, he was prov proven to be, to be innocent, he was not released. He had to go back to the cities of refuge and stay there until, until when? The accused must stay there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. The death of the high priest anointed with the holy oil would finally bring them the freedom. It is a very simple statement. They had to stay there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. That is actually means, uh, even though it is an intentional sin, the price must be paid accordingly. So the death of the high priest should precede before uh, the, the accused, before the person is released, before the person gets the perfect freedom. Um, well, this is kind of part of the guilt offering. Uh, he shall make restitution for the harm and he, that he has done in regard to the holy thing and shall add one-fifth to it and give it to the priest. So it was not only the sacrifice, but they had to make restitution for the harm, right? So the cross is the price paid even for our unintentional sin restitution for the harm because we as sinners make we do harm for people around us and that needs to be paid even though it is unintentional so the cross is the price paid for even our unintentional sins the letter to the church Laodicean uh, includes this to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen and the faithful and the true witness. True witness. I think most of you are familiar with the timeline when uh, the, Leo, the church of Laodicea, Laodicean church started. So Laodicean church started in 1844 when the judgment started. And the person writing this letter to this church is described as the true witness. You remember the picture of the two goats presented to the Lord, before the Lord? To witness. True witness is there. 
we have our faithful and true witnesses witness and he even risked his life to stand up for us and well next time we'll look at that but when the goat is chosen to be lords the goat was offered as a sin offering so jesus is our vindicator jesus is our witness true witness you know that when we truly appreciate the true witness is when we really need a true testimony which means i didn't intend to do it of course i did do it but um it was not my intent to do it so jesus stands there on our right side as a true witness and he tries to save us from where we are well as we look at this picture of two witnesses two goats of course we have to thank jesus but when we can thank jesus is when we are in a situation where we are falsely accused so those people who have unintentionally committed sin they will look forward to the judgment why because they have the true witness and also the judge will not make mistake on that matter and on the basis of it we can be made sure we can have the assurance of the final forgiveness even though we are falsely accused even though we uh, i mean even when we have come into the refuge jesus christ still we've been falsely accused by satan and that's why we have to stand before the trial before the assembly well this is my last appeal to you uh, i really hope that the fact that there is a true witness can be a really good news for all of us